I've entitled this message, Every Man Stood in His Place. Judges 7, I want to begin reading with verse 9. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible here. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to get thee go down, go thou with Pura, <clears throat> thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Fura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell, and overturned it that the tent lay alone. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look unto me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Bethsheda and Zareth, and to the border of Abimelamoah, unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of all Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Orb and Zeb. And they slew Orb upon the rock Orb. And Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Orb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. God does not want you and me to be intimidated out of being the person that he has saved us and sanctified us to be. Never forget that. Don't you allow anyone or anything to intimidate you out of being what God has willed your life to be. Now, if you're doing the powerful kingdom work that God has called you to do, then you have the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit within you to do that job. And that makes you and I spiritually powerful persons. But for some reason, the body of Christ today can't seem to wrap their minds around that truth. We are indwelt by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. 
and we are able to accomplish anything that God tells us to accomplish if we go according to His Word in His power. There's nothing you cannot accomplish through the Lord. Amen? Amen. And we need to understand that. Not many of God's people today know much about the story of Gideon and his 300 men who won a victory over an overwhelming uh, army of 126,000 Midianites. That's like saying God's going to take every one of us in this sanctuary today and go whip 500,000 people. And he's going to give you a, a trumpet and a pitcher and a small torch to fight with. How many would sign up? <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened here today. And one phrase that was used in this story stood out to me specifically, and it's found in verse 21. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. I want every Christian believer to know and understand how important it is that you stand in your place. That's a must. And if we're going to be victorious as a local body of believers, we must stand in the place that God has called us to stand. Do you realize this morning that when Christian believers are not faithful to what God has gifted them to do, it hurts the kingdom of God and it gives the victory to the enemy. And do you also realize this morning when you cannot be trusted by God to stand in the place where He has called you to stand, it leaves a gap. The wall will have a break in it. And the enemy, the devil, can sneak through and cause chaos within the camp. And he can do that here. If we're not faithful to be the people to stand in our place where God wants us to be, Satan can sneak in here and cause chaos among this church. He'll cause division and confusion, and he'll do his best to destroy everything that God has done for us here. There's too much chaos allowed in the camps of God. All it takes... In this little illustration, all it takes is several hours of our electricity to be out before I start getting aggravated. I mean, the electricity's out, I know that it's out, and I'll still flip the light switch. Huh? How many of us have done that? Yeah. Or I still try to turn on the TV and it won't turn on. I say, what's wrong with this thing? Darling goes, uh... Hey, genius, the electric's out. Kind of aggravating, isn't it? We've become so dependent upon electricity. And when that power is gone, it causes us to have all kinds of little setbacks that drive us crazy. But this... Power, this electrical power can be both positive and negative all at the same time. And that's nothing compared to the power of the Holy Spirit inside you and me. But we don't tap into it. We simply, for whatever reason, do not tap into the power that's available to every single one of us. And God wants to do great and mighty things amongst us. But we fail to use the resources that God has given to all of us. And I want to tell you, folks, listen to me very carefully. There's too many empty seats in this sanctuary. There's too many. And if we would tap into God's power in us, We'd fill this place up. We could become so cramped we'd have to add on. 
But we don't tap into that power. You know why we don't tap into it? We simply cannot get it into our minds to believe that God can and will use us for His honor and His glory. And He wants to. I try to picture God in heaven watching us. And I wonder how many times, even with me, he shook his head and said, if I could just get that heathen to tap into the power that I've already put within him, well, he'd turn this country upside down. And he said the same thing to all of us. If they would just tap in to what they all, listen, what you already have. God could work miracles in our sight. I remember I was working on a job somewhere. And the tool I was using was a pretty good sized tool. I don't even remember what it was now. But it was an electrical tool. And the guy that was working for me couldn't get it to work. And he said, this thing's broken. I said, it can't be. It's brand new. And so I got down off the scaffold and walked over there, and I started looking at it. Then I started following the cord. It was plugged into an extension cord. So I followed that cord. And right here on the wall was an electrical outlet. And down here on the floor was the plug. I said, hey, genius. It's just like salvation. You have to plug in before you can get anything out of it. If you're not plugged into the Holy Spirit, you have no power. You will not work. You'll be useless. Notice I said useless, not worthless. Useless to the work that God wants to accomplish in and through you. You simply are leaving your cord lay on the floor beside the plug. And the Holy Spirit is our power source, but for whatever reason, we just aren't plugged in. He's the invisible presence and power of God. In fact, He is God. The Holy Spirit is deposited into the life of every believer when we give Him our total life, our total desires, and our total ambitions. See, we got to sell out to Him. He's the one that challenged us to stay in our place where God has assigned this to be. So I'm here this morning to help all of you find your place in God's plan and purpose for your life. And this is one of the most important parts of the church's responsibility, to help us to understand what it is that God wants us to do. Now this passage of Scripture is going to give us some guidelines in helping us to find our place in God's work for our life. So number one that I see in this verse, every man was a volunteer. They volunteered. And that's the way it is in the church. We are all volunteers in the army of God. And, and, and uh, chapter 6, verse 35, Gideon had sent messengers throughout the land calling men to follow him and going to war against the Midianites. Listen. 32,000 men gathered at Mount Gilead. They volunteered to be in this army to go against the Midianites. 32,000. Now, let me, let me give you a little heads up here. If I was going to go against 126,000 men of war, these men were soldiers. The Amalekites and the Midianites. These were trained soldiers. 126,000 of them. I would have been apprehensive going to war with just 32,000 men. Me of little faith. 32,000 of them. 
But when Gideon said, and I don't know why he opened his mouth and said it in verse 3, he says, if you're scared, go home. 22,000 men went home. Sissies. Can you imagine what Gideon must have felt like? He goes, now look, boys, if you're, but Gideon, he can't say nothing. Remember what God said to Gideon? I want you to go down the host. And Gideon, if you're afraid, take Furah with you. And then the next verse, and Gideon and Furah went. See, Gideon was afraid too. So he really couldn't say anything when 22,000 men just turned around and marched back home. Boy, his army dwindled quick. But those that remained were true volunteers. I want to tell you something. There's a difference between a volunteer and a true volunteer. Some people volunteer because there might be something in it for them. Some people volunteer because they want to be seen by everybody else. They're volunteer, but they're not really a true biblical volunteer. And that's what Gideon had going here. A, a volunteer army is always superior to a recruited army. It, you see, there's a different kind of commitment when you volunteer. And a lot of times, Christians have to be coerced to get involved in God's work. And that is so sad. I had a pastor that was so desperate for people to serve in the church and he couldn't get them to serve. And he hired people to come in and do the job in the church. Now you think about that one. And I want to tell you something. A hireling will never give 100%. And very seldom will a hiring do anything for Jesus. Because the hirelings after one thing, a paycheck. And if you don't think what I'm saying is true, do this. You remember when you all used to have jobs that you got up and went to every day? Would you got up and went to that same job every day if they had ever paid you? No. The whole purpose of getting up and going to work was to have a paycheck, to pay the bills, to buy the food, take care of the kids. So it's the same thing with a hireling. And everything that was true in Gideon's case is true in the church today. One of the Holy Spirit's chief role is to empower believers to live supernatural lives. We're to live above all of these things. And a lot of you know this by heart, but it's one of my favorite verses in Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He didn't say when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you might be empowered or you could be empowered. He said, you will be empowered. Now listen to me very carefully. Don't tell me that you're filled with the Spirit of God and you refuse to serve God. A person that is filled with the Spirit will be faithful in their service to God Almighty. You know why? They're in love with Jesus. And they wouldn't think of looking for a pat on the back or getting praise from the pulpit. And God forbid you offer money. I remember the first time I went to preach at a church. We got through with the service, and Darlene and I got our things together, and we was walking out to the car, and here come a, a woman, I guess she was the 
secretary of the church, Wade, where are you going? And we turned around and she goes, you didn't get your money. And I said, what money? We're going to pay you for preaching. I want to tell you something. I was genuinely offended. That offended me so bad. Now, I didn't let on that it offended me. But I didn't go there to preach for money. I went there to preach because God told me that I'm supposed to win souls. And I went there and I preached a salvation message. And I remember I went back to my church and talked to my pastor about it. He said, Vanover, let me tell you something. Don't you ever do that again. I said, what do you mean don't do it again? He said, listen to me. A laborer is worthy of his hire. I said, I wasn't hired. He goes, you're taking everything out of context. He said, you offended them. And you cannot, listen, you cannot get a church used to having everything done for nothing. It'll ruin them. It took me a long time to get that in my head. So I learned to take it. And if it was a real small church and they were struggling, I took it. But we always sent them an offering in the mail. We just deposited it in our checking account and wrote them a check for a little bit more than they gave me and just sent it back to them. We wanted to give you a love offering. See, I killed two birds, one stone. Sometimes all we have to do is sit and think a little bit. Now, you're not going to believe this, but the Holy Spirit wants to use your brain. I always tell people, when you come to church, bring your brains with you. Huh? Bring your brain. Some people just take them out and throw them in the glove box before they come in the building. Bring your brains with you. If we don't have this feeling of God's Holy Spirit, all kinds of negative things will come into play in our relationship with God. You know what we do? If we don't rely on the power of the Holy Spirit within us, we'll begin to compromise. And we will convince ourselves to rely on half-truths. Just like the devil when he beguiled Eve. Did God truly say? And he'll use the same thing. Did God really call you or was it just an emotional high you were on at the moment and you jumped in there and did it without thinking? Huh? Every man stood in his place. Take, for example, that 22,000 men that were afraid and left Gideon to fight with just 10,000. I wonder if they even felt guilty over that. When we don't have the Holy Spirit's indwelling fullness and power, we will allow the enemy to get a foothold in our lives and we will react in fear and a lack of spiritual power and we won't be able to fight for God at all. Here's what happens. Your, your mind will become a battlefield where Satan will attack you. Satan loves to get into our thought life. That's why the Bible says, if there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these things. Things, whatsoever things are true, lovely, good report, honest. Think on that. Why? Because if you don't, the devil will put things in your head to think on. It happens every time you win somebody to Jesus. I, oh, I can't stress this enough. When you get saved, you get into a church that preaches the Bible. You get into a church that will help you to grow as a Christian. Because if you don't, I promise you, Satan will convince you God didn't save you. 
or something will happen and the devil will say, see, you don't have that power that Jesus said he was going to give you. You can't overcome that. Or he'll send your old friends to you. And they say, you've got to be kidding me. You're into that Jesus stuff. I remember I won a guy to the Lord. And I was talking to somebody that I knew very well, and I told him, I said, I just want him to the Lord. You know what he told me? He said, well, I'm going to go get him out of that blankety-blank stuff. I go, why would you do that? He gave up his drink, and he treats his wife like she should be treated. He's living a good life for Jesus. Why would you do that? Because it's nonsense. Satan will use anybody to try to bring you. See, you and I have within us the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And when you let Satan get the upper hand in your life, you're telling God his power isn't powerful enough for you. And a lot of us, we, listen, we've got 220 power, but we're running on 110. 220 power will knock you down. My father-in-law was telling me. He said, Jim, I was down in the basement hooking a dryer up. 220. He said, I had those wires. He said, you got to understand something. I had one end in the fuse box hooked up. The other end, he held them out like that. He said, here was a bare wire, here was a bare wire, and here was a bare wire. He said, I told Marty, his wife, to turn off the electric to the dryer. She said, I got it. And he said, now, Marty, if you ever want to know if there's electric in the wires, here's what you do. You just touch them together. He went, poof. And he said, a big ball went up in the air. He said, Jim, he said, I was in there messing around with that thing. She said it was off. She turned the water or the electric off to the pump, the well pump. Oh, 220 will knock you on your derriere <laughs> or kill you. I want to tell you something. Don't you think for a minute that the power of God isn't powerful. But we never tap in. Every one of us. I'm going to say this, including myself. A run on 110. 110 is what you get when you go up there and plug into a regular socket. 220 is what your dryer is hooked to. I'd much rather operate on 220. Amen? Because God's got things he wants to do for us, and he can't do it because we refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to have all of us. A lot of people think, well, I, I've had people say, I don't want to serve God. <laughs> I could spend the rest of the day on that one. If you don't want to serve God, it's because you don't have God. Simple as that. Jesus said, don't come and tell me you love me if you won't do what I command. That's what Jesus says. Satan will infiltrate your thinking. He'll cause you to waver in your faith. He'll tell you you can't trust God. He'll tell you that God just does not understand your situation. I hear that all the time when it comes to tithing. I just don't make much money. I can't afford the tithe. That's Satan talking. That's Satan talking. That's why God said 10%. It's proportional. Let me ask you something. Do you think God knows what he's doing? See, that's where you're not trusting in that power that you already have in you. You won't tap into it. You know, Darlene and I were dumb enough to think if we gave 10%, 10% of 30 bucks is $3. We were just goofy enough to think God's going to take this and bless it. 
God might be able to win. We, we could probably win a soul to Jesus with this $3. We give it to the church and we trust the church to take it and use it to the glory of God. We actually believe that. You know what? God blessed that $3. And he blessed us too. You've got to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit or you're not going to do anything for God. And you're going to live in your own little world. You're going to have a very limited view of God and heaven and church. And I'll tell you something else. Everything that you do will be seen through the eyes of, why does everything happen to me? You know why? Because when you refuse to trust God, He'll let you trust yourself. And that's when Satan shows up. How's your position in this volunteer army of God? We're a church family of volunteer soldiers that have enlisted in the work of His kingdom. Are you on your post this morning? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you serving the Lord somewhere? Are you giving your time and talent to God and faithfully executing what He's called you to do? Can God say you're a good soldier? Secondly, I see every man was alert. The test given to the remaining army of 10,000 is usually interpreted as a test of alertness and readiness. Only 300 men passed this test. I wonder if that tells us something about every church. Sometimes in the church, only so many people are going to pass the test. I want to be in the group that passes the test. I think Gideon had to have been greatly discouraged. How in the world could he defeat that army of 126,000 soldiers with 300 men? Hang on to what I'm getting ready to say. A very, very good friend of mine and a very, very spiritual man that is so keen in his perception of the Word of God came to me and said, Pastor, because he knew I was discouraged. We had a lot of people leave this church. And he knew it bothered me. Nothing bothers me anymore when there's people I think I can trust will turn their backs and walk out. And they do it all the time. But he said, Pastor, you remember Gideon? He went from 32,000 to 300 men. He did that so he could get the glory. Pastor, it might be what God's doing here. He whittled us down to the people that he could trust. And we're about to see the mighty work of God in this place. Man, when he told me that, it energized me. And ever since he told me that, I've been working on putting this message together. And he told me that probably six, seven months ago. I want to tell you something. We are prime candidates in this church for a miracle from God. And if something like that were to happen, only God can get the glory. Amen? Every man was alert. I know a lot of pastors have been so discouraged. And discouragement is a terrible thing in ministry. I get so discouraged every time somebody walks up and they say, Pastor so-and-so is going to leave the church. My heart breaks and I die just a little bit more when I hear that. The first thing you do is blame yourself. But I had to quit doing that because I know that when I preach God's Word, it comes from, God, from the Bible. It, comes, it is His Word. You're not getting ideas and thoughts and assumptions. You're getting the Word of God this morning. So I don't have to apologize when somebody goes, I'm not getting fed. <laughs> Let me tell you something. 
There's only one class of people that has to rely on somebody to feed them, and those are babies. And you come to me and say, Pastor, I'm just not getting fed. I say, didn't you get any pablum this morning? I'm going to throw a little diaper on my shoulder and put you up here and pat you till you burp. <laughs> and if you up chuck a little, that's okay. We're supposed to be mature Christians. When I get fed, it's because I sit at God's table and feed myself. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Why? Because he couldn't get encouragement from anybody else. So he went to the Lord and encouraged himself. Sometimes we have to go to the Bible and search and hunt and wait for the voice of God to speak to us and to strengthen our hands like he did Gideon. And I want to tell you something. Very few people will volunteer to help you in your ministry. We see that with Gideon here. Listen, 300 men against 126,000 trained soldiers? That's impossible! Unless God's in it. Amen. In fact, God told Gideon, hey Gideon, listen, if you march in there with 32,000 men and they get victory, if I give you the victory, they're going to go home and say, we did it. And they're not going to acknowledge me. So get in, I want you to do it 300. And get in. You've already won the battle. The battle's yours. All you have to do is move. Move a little, Gideon. Go towards it. You remember David and Goliath? The Bible says David ran towards Goliath. You got to run towards the enemy. And God will run with you. And he'll give you the victory. Remember Jesus condemned the slothful servant. Listen to Matthew 25, 27. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou, thou oughtest therefore have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. He said, you could at least put it in the bank, and I got a little bit of interest on it. He called him a evil, Evil, wicked, and slothful servant. What was the problem? This servant was unaware and unalert of what God was doing. The other two didn't have a problem with it. People today are looking for a church where they can be accepted. And if we're not sensitive to this, and we don't go the extra mile and make them feel welcome here at this church, they're going to go somewhere else. And think back to the time you first came here. Weren't you made to feel welcome? Amen. Absolutely. God's looking for a powerful people that he can use just like those 300 plus Gideon. And I call this power the Holy Spirit difference. The Holy Spirit difference. It didn't happen because of change in their environment. It didn't happen because they got a new pastor. It didn't happen because they got into some class of uh, positive thinking somewhere. They received the Holy Spirit power, and then it happened. Thirdly, every man was equipped. The equipment of Gideon's army was strange. They were given a trumpet, an empty pitcher, and a torch to put inside the pitcher. Now, I want to tell you something. Right there, if I was in that 300 group, right there I thought, uh-oh. Maybe I should have left with those 22,000. The Bible doesn't say anybody even thought that. Let me tell you something about these 300. I can't prove this. But I have to believe these 300 men were completely, totally sold out to God. And I believe these 300 men had ingrained in their minds, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I think they thought back when their fathers crossed the Jordan River into the promised land. If he did it for them and God is no respecter of persons, he's going to do it for us. 
A lot of times we have to think back of when God moved in our lives and worked things out that we can't even explain. But we don't even do that. A simple formula that brings encouragement is this. You plus God equals enough. You plus God equals enough. Amen? If I've got God, why worry about anything else? God doesn't expect the impossible from us. He works the impossible through us. And then every man was obedient. Every man stood in his place. You know, theocracies God controlled. The problem in America today, we have no spiritual leadership. None. We have a theocracy, not a democracy. God has placed pastors in his churches for spiritual leadership. I don't take that lightly. I knew when I accepted this pastorate that I was going to have to make some decisions. I've made decisions that were not popular. But don't you ever think I make those decisions without getting a hold of God first. I had somebody come into my office not long after I was here. I said, Pastor, did you pray about it? I said, yes, I did. He goes, why aren't you doing something? I said, I'm still waiting on God. You don't move until you hear from God. And that person said, well, I'll just leave then. I said, well, I, I said, we, we'd like to keep you here, but you're going to have to do what you have to do. They left. Christians somehow struggle to obey the will of God that they already know is God's will for their life. I mean, a lot of Christians are looking, searching for God's will, but there's so many out there that don't obey the will that they already know is from God. I had a person tell me, I know it's God's will that I do this, but I said, no buts. How can you even think of asking God for anything else until you're obedient in this area? doesn't work that way. And again, Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? When Gideon and his army stood every man in their place, there was a great victory. Now listen to me. 300 men. Gideon divided them into three groups of 100 men each. He put them in various places around that camp of 126,000 men. He said, I want you to take your picture. This torch was just a little hyssop reed soaked in olive oil, and that's what the torch was. And they put it down inside the pitcher and a trumpet. He said, now I want you to do everything I do. When I blow my trumpet, you blow your trumpet. When I break that pitcher, you break your pitcher and take that torch in your left hand and your trumpet in your right hand and you blow that trumpet and you said the army of Gideon and the Lord. You do it as exactly as I tell you. And they did. Have you ever wondered why God didn't give them conventional weapons to fight this war? Who goes to... I, when Jimmy was in Afghanistan, I remember I asked him this. I said, Jimmy, did they give you a pitcher? <laughs> he goes, what are you talking about? I said, you should have had a pitcher and a torch or a flashlight and a trumpet. <laughs> he said, Dad, I ain't got time for this. <laughs> that, think if we just... Our armies did that to our men today. Well, we'd think they've done lost their minds. And when they did what Gideon told them to do, the Bible said all 126,000 men jumped up and cried and fled and they pulled their swords out and started stabbing one another. And these 300 men just stood there and said, man, look at these crazy guys. All those 300 men could do was say, 
Thank you, Jesus. God wants to work a miracle here. I guess the question is, are we willing to be obedient to all that he says so that we can see that it is indeed God doing it and we can give him the praise? Let's stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to ask you a question. Would God be able to say to you, you're a good soldier. I know I can depend on you. I know if I call you to do something, you'll do it. Can he say that? Are you relying totally on the Holy Spirit power within you? Or are you a little apprehensive? Say, I can't do that job. It's, I just can't do it. I, I'm not equipped. You're not equipped because you don't plug into the Holy Spirit. He's your equipper. And I just wonder how many would come forth this morning and say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to be one of the 300. I'm going to be one of the 300. Remember, God gave, uh, Gideon gave him a water test. God said, Gideon, you take them down there and tell them to get a drink of water out of the river. And he said, everybody that gets down on their knees and laps like a dog, send them home. 9,700 men did that out of the 10,000. 300 men got down on one knee and took their hand and cupped it and brought the water up to their mouth. Never took their eyes off the enemy. God is looking for soldiers that keep their eyes on the enemy and they can't be fooled. Anybody else? I'm in your army, God. Strengthen my hand. I want to answer the call, Lord. I want to answer the call. I'm yours, Jesus. I've stayed in boot camp a little too long, Lord. I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't want to sit in the barracks any longer, Lord. I want out on the battlefield. I'm ready, Lord. With you, I can do anything. Without you, I can do nothing. Lord, we want victory in this church. We want more souls in this church. And Lord, we're going to trust you to make it happen through us. Anybody else? Lord, I'm coming because I want you to know you can depend on me. Anybody else before we pray? If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's where it starts. Jesus said if you'd receive him, he'd give you the power that you need to live the Christian life. So I'm going to ask you to step out and come forward and receive Jesus as your Savior. You may never get another opportunity like this. One more time before we pray. Anybody else? Father, gathered at this altar today are men and women that want to serve you. They want to rely on the power that they already have. Help them to tap into it and help them to go boldly where they normally would never think of going because they go in the power of Jesus Christ. And may we do everything to your honor and your glory. And Lord, we ask you to help us to fill this church up with souls that will be on fire for Jesus. The time is short, and Lord, we need to be busy about our Father's business. Thank you for what you're going to do. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in thy holy name, and all of God's people say together, Amen. 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 Thanks for tuning in. To hear more messages from the Bible, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when we upload new sermons. You can also follow us on Facebook and lighthousememorial.com. God bless.